Okay, friends, book of Judges, chapter 14, verse 1, Mark. Then Samson went down to the tree and saw a woman up there, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Okay, the narrative, the book of uh, Judges, especially the Samson account, it just kind of teems with subtle and obvious geographical, geographical terms okay, and geographical place names. And most of these are located in the picture we showed earlier of what's called the Soric Valley. And this is one of the five 44s that come from 80 to Highway 5. Um, Timna was about um, probably about an hour walk uh, from Samson ho Samson's house. And uh, there's the tunnel. Verse number two, Lane. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Returning from the city that was originally given to Judah in Joshua chapter 15, verse 7, and then given to the tribe of Dan, and soon lost to the Philistines, the young judge characteristically represents all of Israel, and he goes headlong, headfirst, into that which is forbidden. Now, it was apparently a custom in the world of the Bible for the parents, especially the father, of the interested son, the father of the interested son, to inquire of the father of the sought-after girl if such an arrangement was possible or plausible, and what would be the terms of the agreement. The father of the bride is losing, if he has three daughters, we'll just say, he's losing a third of his workforce, in, in a sense, and he needs to be uh, recompensed for losing a third of his workforce, which is uh, the whole dowry idea. Okay. So here's Timna, here's where the girl lives, and remember, Samson lives right there, so basically he's just heading west down Highway 44, down the Sorok Valley. That's it, just an hour walk. Okay, it's like walking from here to, what's an hour from here? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Old Shasta, probably. Something like that. Okay. Verse number 3, 14-3, John. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives, or among all your people, that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Though Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Apparently, appalled at his disregard for scripture, Deuteronomy 7 3, do not intermarry with them, do not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons. Very black and white. So, Apparently appalled at his disregard for the scriptures, his parents plead with him to marry your cousin. <laughs> now, of course, remember in their world, uh, that's okay. That's what you do. Marry a cousin or some kind of relative within your own tribe. Or even an Israelite girl from a different tribe. Samson's response is mistranslated in the King James. Get her for me, for she pleaseth me. Well, it's mistranslated, but you should instead read what John's translation, which is ESV. ESV reads. She's right in my own eyes. Why? Well, not only is it the correct translation, but it fits with the overall, or one of the overall themes of the book. Right? Everyone's doing right. What's in their own eyes? 14.4. Uh, but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord. And he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Well, who saw an occasion against the Philistines? The reader, I think, is taken aback to learn that it's the will of Yahweh. Is it the will of Yahweh for Samson to wed the enemy? Was it God's will? But his father and his mother knew not, knew what? Knew not what? That Samson was going to marry her. And it was what? Of the Lord that this would happen. 
the marriage to the Canaanite woman would somehow, some way, give him, he'd be a mole, give him this insider opportunity to remove the Philistine oppression from within. What you're looking at here is an artist's rendition from Medina Abu in Egypt. I don't even know if I've been there, maybe. Uh, anyways, uh, this is the relief from Ramses III from 1147 BC, which represents his repulsion of the sea people. That, friends, is a Philistine. That's what a Philistine looked like. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. What's that they wear on there? That is a good question. Uh, it would be the equivalent of a, what is it, a headdress. Address. Verse 5. Right. Then went Samson down, and his father and his mother to Timnah, and came to the leaders of Timnah. And behold, a young lion roared against him. While the family, apparently the whole family, the family of Samson made their track to Timnah from Zorah to negotiate the terms of the wedding. You guys have it so easy today, right? Uh -huh. It's just like, you know, <laughs> half of them don't even ask the father. And if they do ask the father, you know, it's like, man, do you know how much more you can get out of this kid? You can probably get seven years worth of free labor. <laughs> That's how I'm going to be. No, just kidding. Actually, I might. No. Um, <laughs> um, so they're going to negotiate the terms of the way. They're encountered by a wild beast on the outskirts of the city. Not only are they encountered by this wild beast, they're encountered by the wild beast in a forbidden area for a Nazarite, a vineyard. Why is he in the vineyard? Why is he in the vineyard? He's not supposed to be near a vineyard. Numbers chapter 6, verse 3. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, there are no wild lions lurking in the Holy Land today. Maybe it was a different season and the grapes weren't in bloom, or maybe the vineyard was okay for them to go into. That's an idea. That's an idea. Let's put that in the back of our mind. Put that in the back burner. Now we read about lions from numerous genres from the Bible, right? First Samuel 17, David grabbed a lion and killed it. Uh, Byzantine sources, the, the early monks who lived from 324 to 640 AD in Israel, they often write about their encounter with lions. The frequency of lions in the region of Judah, it gave rise to the name of a city called Labaot, Labaot in Judges 15.32, which means something like the city of the lions, something like that. Okay. Um, as close as you can possibly get a few years ago, someone living in the Negev on a beautiful night was sleeping with their uh, window open, but the screen open as well. And lo and behold, a jaguar jumped through the screen and into bed with Shlomo. <laughs> and uh, Shlomo was, uh, he got out of there okay, locked the door, and he called uh, 911. Okay, so there still are some wild beasts. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, the wild beasts would have generally have abode in what's called the, the, the Jordan Rift Valley. But during the, the swelling of the Jordan River, um, the, uh, the thickets would, uh, uh, the water rising in the thickets would push the animals out, up into the hills. And that's when some people like to place the account of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness because he is. There's wild, he's being encountered by a wild animal. So, I don't know. Maybe. Verse number six. Mark. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Facing great danger, the Spirit of the Lord cloaked, literally cloaked Samson like a garment, just like you put coat on you or something like that, and you're covered in that coat, that's how the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and cloaked him like a garment, giving him the power to catch the beast by his beard, probably tearing out his throat. That's what 
Josephus says. Okay? In, interestingly enough, we're looking at here's a somewhat recent find of an Iron Age II seal. We all know what a seal is, right? That you have used to impress upon clay or wax or some substance, right? To identify your name, your person. An Iron Age II seal dating from this time, the same time, was recently found at Bet Shemesh, displaying a true but crude representation of Samson, looking at it right here, without a weapon in his hand, confronting a lion. Very interesting, huh? Verse number seven. Who's got that one? Bob. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. Sorry, I you. Not hurrying to spread the rumor of his feet. Not hurrying to spread the rumor of his feet to his parents or to his fiance or anyone else, because he doesn't want to spook them out, right? He's trying to get in their circle. And if he did boast of this, it may have warded off the marriage. And thereby the opportunity for Samson to remove Israel from their oppression. For the Philistines would have, if they haven't already, would have greatly feared him. You just killed the lion with your bare hands and ripped out its throat? <laughs> eh, I don't know how close we want you to us, you know. Verse number 8, we'll go back to that. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. And it was a swarm of bees and some honey. After an undisclosed period of time, but I would bet you money marbles to chalk, a year, a year later, standard year, that's how long the betrothal period was, and later customs in Israel, a year, he retraced his steps from Zorah to Timnath and came upon the carcass of the lion, which Josephus says that he he cast the carcass into a wooden area to conceal his feet. So Josephus says, and it may be right, maybe an oral tradition that existed at that time. Because people are going to see the lion. With its maybe we'll say its throat ripped out. Who did this? You know? Everyone's gonna want to know who did it but by possibly hiding the corpse, right? It gets away with it. Since according to naturalists, people who know what they're talking about, bees flee from dwelling among a corpse with rotting flesh. It is likely to therefore confer with Josephus, who states that a year had passed. Now the corpse is decayed. And now the bees have time to make honeycombs in the breasts of the lion. There are other accounts, other narratives from antiquity, such as Herodotus, who mentions bees dwelling in and producing honey in the hung up skeletal remains of a king of Cyprus. Chapter 14, verse 9, John. He scraped it out into his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Okay, I like the translation take better than scrape. And here's why. Remember in Genesis chapters 1 through 11, we have many motifs or patterns in Genesis 1 through 11, which are later used by New Testament or Old Testament authors. And one of the early patterns is to um, see, take, give, eat. Okay? See, take, eat. And just as others like Eve, who saw that the tree was good for food, and pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat. Saw, took, ate. Later, sons of God, came to pass and then began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took the wives of all which they chose, and they proverbially eat them. Saw, took, and ate. This is exactly 
which was forbidden, this is what Samson does. <coughs> Without any regard of ceremonially defiling his parents with unclean food, shattering the vow of the Nazarene, Samson, according to Josephus, took three honeycombs, one for himself and two for his parents. Chapter 14, verse 10, Bob. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there, for a young man used to do so. But, but number 6-6 six, six says it's a dead person, not a dead mind. Okay. okay. So I would say that that's... Uh, If I was a Nazarite, let's just put it this way, but I, would, I would hedge myself and not even touch anything that. Impressed with the gift of honey, the father of Samson, not the mother, remember, because she's portrayed as the wise one, the father of Samson attends this customary drinking feast, just like in Esther chapter 1, verse 3. Why? This drinking feast where you would negotiate and hammer out all the final details was essentially okay, the wedding. Some traditions read that Samson made the feast, whereas other traditions say it was his father, which would have apparently later in the history of Israel be accepted. Later in the history of Israel, it would have been accepted that that the father did it. But we'll just go with the rendering of the verse. Verse number 11, round. When it came to pass, when they saw that they brought 30 companions to be with him. As apparently was the custom, the friends of the bridegroom, John 3 29, come forth to meet the bridegroom. And they do so with common circumstance. It is the custom. So, once again, the custom was the friends of the bridegroom, like John 3, 29. John 3, 29. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the best man is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. So, the bridegroom come forth to meet. Friends of the bridegroom come forth to meet the bridegroom. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Chapter 14. Verse 12, Mark. Then Samson said to him, Let me know, or found a riddle to you, if you will indeed tell it to me within the seven days of the feast, and find it out, and I will give you thirty linen wraps and thirty changes of clothes. During the first day, the first day of the marriage feast, and it lasted a week, Samson makes things interesting by seeking to profit from his unknown feat of slaying the lion, thinking himself to be wise. Okay, we're going to be with each other for a week. We're going to be drinking a lot and eating a lot. Let's make things fun. I'm going to put forth a bet. Okay, verse number 13, Lane. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments. 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. The prize to be had were wide garments, as you can see up on the screen. Wide garments made of fine linen sheets worn upon the body and under the tunic, under the tunic, right here, with which one would use to keep warm during the night, as well as a traditional outer garment, right here, which would be worn in the daytime. Remember, in the world of the Bible, in the world of the Bible, wealth is valued in precious metals, riches, and clothing. James chapter 5, where he says, um, Come now, you rich, weep and howl, for your miseries are coming upon you. For your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth eaten, and your gold and silver are corrupted. Riches? Clothes, gold and silver, that's your bank accounts. Okay. So, there we go. 
Verse 14. Johnny. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. All right. Having agreed to the terms, before they heard the riddle, Samson, thinking himself smart, uses the unknown or seemingly unknown incident of him slaying the lion as the basis for the riddle. Josephus translate, translates the riddle as following. Josephus translates it as, that which devours all things furnishes out pleasant food when that itself is altogether unpleasant. Verse 15, Bob. But it came to pass on the seventh day, they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband, that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? Upon grave and serious betrayal, the, uh, apparently the custom of the Philistines was to not only execute the entire family for the sin, but to demolish their house. Now, according to Babylonian and Persian customs, the house in which the condemned lived was sometimes destroyed, but sometimes it was left vacant as a, uh, a visual reminder of the perpetual curse upon that household for what their son did. Now, a similar custom was also known among the Hebrews, who destroyed the uh, dwelling place of Achan and raised a great heap over his house. And this, to this very day, the idea of uh, bulldozing a house of a convicted terrorist in Israel still exists. It's all about blaming your family, your house and your family. And if your, your son kills himself, blows himself up, well, guess what? We're going to just destroy your home. It's a great deterrent to crime. Do you want your house destroyed and knocked over with a bulldozer? No. Uh oh. <laughs> Verse 16. Who's got that? So, Ron? And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou hast thy hate me and lovest me. Thou hast put forth a riddle to the children of my people and hast not told it to me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father and my mother. And I tell it to me. The wife of Samson greatly fears the termination, the destruction of her family, and the loss of any kind of inheritance she'll ever receive. So she pleads with Samson to show some compassion, some compassion upon the clan that he is now associated with by marriage. And once again, land and family here are the two threads which knit the fabric of their society together. That's her main concern, right? Verse 17, Mark. However, she wept before him seven days while her feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him so hard, she told him the riddle of the sons of her people. Wishing rather to dwell in the wilderness than with this crazy woman, the judge tells her the secret to the riddle, and in doing so, he preserves her family and he preserves her land from destruction. All the while, he knows that in doing so, he's going to put, put himself in, in, a, in a great dilemma. Verse number 18. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, If you had not fought with my hyphen, you would not have solved my living. Samson compares his young wife to a heifer. Now, young, naive, and not accustomed to being under the yoke with which was put upon her. That's what it means. That's why he calls her a heifer. She's young, she's naive, and she's not used to having that yoke put upon her. The pattern or idea, just as a footnote here, of the day beginning in the evening time, of course, is rooted in the early chapters of Genesis. This blueprint of evening and morning threads itself all the way through the scriptures, even eschatologically. 
as um, the evening comes before the morning, just as uh, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, distress, wastes, desolation, darkness, gloominess, clouds, thick darkness, the day of the Lord, then comes, right, the light, right, that kingdom will come, that will be done, right, that kind of package. Verse number 19, John 8. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and struck down thirty men of the town, and took their spoil, and gave the, gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to the father's house. The site of Ashkelon, you can see where Samson was, right here at Timnah. He's going down there to Ashkelon, located on the southern coastal Philistine plain. And uh, the modern day city of Ashkelon is right next to the ancient city. The site is located right on the shipping route that ran from Egypt along the coast of Israel, right here, up to Bidnos. It's just off Highway 80, just as driving from the Great Truck Route that connects Egypt to Mesopotamia. Samson would have taken the Sorek Valley this way until he reached Highway 80, the International Highway, headed south, at least a full day's walk. It's over 20 miles, 24 miles. And upon reaching the city, he murders 30 innocent men and steals their belongings in order to pay his debt. Verse 20, Mark. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his friend. In wrath, Samson forsakes his wife, forsakes his new clan to return to his home city to move into his parents' basement. Returns to his home city, which propels, because he did that, the effect of that is the father of the bride tries to save face, tries to save his daughter's face by giving the girl to a guest of the wedding. A guest of the wedding. That is to say, he probably gave her uh, to one of the children of the bridegroom. 